Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem Studio on TV7's Israel News. I'm Amir Oren, sitting in for Jonathan Hessen, who will be back shortly. And our topic today is a variation on the Red Menace, the Red Sea this time. We all heard of uh, maritime choke points. We uh, used to think of uh, Hormuz, of the Straits of Tehran, maybe Gibraltar or uh, other points um, in the Indo-Pacific region. But as of late, uh, Bab el Mandeb and other points in and around the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, the uh, Gulf of Aden, all of that uh, is now under the gun, or in this case, under the missiles and drones of the Houthis, Ansar Allah um, of Yemen. And to analyze uh, what is happening and what can be done about it, we have uh, with us uh, from Washington, D.C., retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett of uh, the U.S. Army, formerly of uh, both the Central Command, the Department of Defense, and the Department of State, where he was an Assistant Secretary for uh, Political Military Affairs. Welcome, General. Good morning, Amir. And uh, here in Israel, uh, we have Michal Beitalachmi, um, a geopolitical expert whose research uh, has focused on the Houthis and what can be done about them. So, General, we are six months into this uh, fight with the Houthis, uh, which seems to be very low level. Um, there has been no daring raid by uh, SEALs or Delta Force to take out their assets. Uh, several uh, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, and uh, the United Kingdom in its various assets, uh, they uh, have uh, uh, hit some of the Houthis' um, assets and facilities. They have tried to locate and hit their underground facilities, but to no avail. What can be done? Well, at this point, that's more of a policy decision than it is a military uh, position, because again, I think a lot could be done if we could do dry feet operation, actually put boots on the ground inside of Yemen. Uh, obviously, the Biden administration is trying to avoid that at all costs. And it seems right now that the strategy is a little more than uh, to continue to attack the supply lines providing uh, supplies to the Houthis and fundamentally wait till they shoot off all of their ammunition and then declare it a success. The second thing, of course, is that the Biden administration believes that the Houthis are good to their word that once the Gaza situation is settled, then they will stop uh, firing their missiles. I, I think both of those are based on poor assumptions. And candidly, I think we're going to see this for quite some time. Michal, um, if you uh, were to be uh, the uh, top woman uh, in the White House, even above Kabbalah Harris, um, and you uh, were to direct policy. As General Kimmich says, it's, it's not a matter for the Central Command or the Fifth Fleet to decide what to do. They, of course, uh, are presenting options and they are uh, able and ready to execute them once the uh, political directive is given. But if you consider everything you know about the American policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran in general. Um, the uh, uh, vision or the, the defense doctrine which regards China as uh, the pacing competitor, the Ukraine, the main uh, fronts of the Israel-Hamas wars. What would you have done differently than Biden? Well, thank you again for having me. Um, I think that uh, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Kimmett that the U.S. policy has been diplomacy first, uh, but I also agree with him that it is not enough and it is not going the way that diplomacy should go, especially when you deal with a, a terrorist arm that uh, only just recently they slightly designated it after a while and um, did not, it didn't occur to them to do that before, which I think was a mistake regarding the 
big, big, big escalation that they have caused in the Red Sea, but not only in the Red Sea. Everything that had done, had the Houthis have done since the beginning of this war has been to prove their abilities. And nobody has a clear vision of their arsenal, but they have been demonstrating it and they have developed it throughout the years with the help of Iran, with uh, North Korean weapons and the minor shipment um, um, catches that the U.S. Navy has done with CENTCOM help and, and other uh, facilitators, I think is not hardly enough of what they actually have in their power to do. If I were to uh, um, talk in a political plus security issues, I would say that the first thing that they should do is pay attention to Iran's assistance, which has been constant in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Aden, with the uh, spy ship, Bashad, which has been following every activity of the Houthis and every attack very closely. It has to do with attacking Iran first. If we were to um, take, for example, the Bashad has been um, following every every attack very closely, and it shift it shipped it shifted its uh, locations according to the attacks that we see from Al Hudaydah to the Gulf of Aden, and basically being located near Djibouti, where there are U.S. troops located, and and is a danger to the U.S. troops in general. The Houthis have been firing at U.S. Uh, warships. And um, I think that the first thing they, they should do is disable the, the spy ship uh, to really show Iran that they cannot help the Houthis as they want. The Houthis are a, not a proxy, but an enabling arm of Iran's strategy. Iran's strategy is a long-term strategy. It will not stop just because the Gaza war stops. It will continue to develop. It will continue to harm uh, regional and global actors. Uh, John Kimmett, as a former CENTCOM planner, uh, you are probably the last person um, uh, who needs uh, to be reminded that when uh, U.S. servicemen are stationed in the Arabian Peninsula, bad things uh, can happen, like uh, Hobart Towers in Saudi Arabia and the USS Cole in Aden, which, by the way, um, may have led to the uh, errors in judgment uh, a year later when Al-Qaeda's uh, plots were considered to focus on U.S. Uh, servicemen abroad rather than uh, the homeland. Um, so is that um, uh, a valid recommendation to put boots on the ground, especially in Yemen, uh, where the Egyptian uh, military... Uh, tried and failed in the uh, 1960s. Uh, it's a very inhospitable terrain. Um, what's the point? I wouldn't put U.S. forces or special operations forces directly on the ground. I mean, we also saw that in 1991, where we had the famous Scud chase inside of Iraq, where we sent a lot of special operations forces in, and they were pretty unsuccessful. But what I would do would actually work by, with, and through the Yemeni government and use their forces so that we, in fact, use them uh, in so many words as our proxy. They know the terrain. They know the landscape. They know the enemy they're fighting. I would be using my special operations not in direct action, but as an advisory group to get everything and anything that the Yemeni forces needed to go out and do the dirty work for us. Ms. Betalachmi, uh, the uh, term which General Kimi just used, direct action, also had uh, another meaning in, in uh, special forces parlance, and that is targeted killings, assassinations. Um, should the U.S. Uh, announce or warn the leaders of the Ansar Allah, the Houthis, that they will personally be uh, held uh, responsible and that their own lives uh, would be on the line if they don't cease and desist. Well, we've just recently uh, got confirmation that there were Iranian advisors that were killed during uh, the coalition attacks 
on Yemen soil. Uh, I think that was the first time that there was an admission of that, that uh, the actual uh, fact that we know that Iranian um, advisors, as we call them, uh, are uh, on, on the Yemen soil and helping the Houthis uh, executing the attacks. And, and all the strategy that is involved around uh, the siege on Bab al-Mandab and the attacks in the Red Sea. Um, I think that, again, um, the Houthis have different reasons for the attacks, but I want to raise another question. If the Americans have been so reluctant to execute attacks um, on, on Yemen, it, it only started about a couple of months ago, I think that we got a confirmation that they are attacking um, uh, missile salvos and, and underground facilities of the Houthis. And it doesn't seem that the Houthis are reacting either way to it. It doesn't seem to stop or halt their operations. And I wonder, uh, I have another question coming. Why do the Houthis use all this ammunition and attacks and strategy not to raise um, any demands regarding Yemen. They control a big, uh, vast land, and they are in negotiation with Saudi Arabia, which has chosen to refrain, as such as Egypt that chose to refrain, even though they're losing massive amounts of cash because of the Suez Canal being not very uh, approachable at the moment. So I wonder, does America have a reason to continue the civil war on Yemen's, um, Yemen's soil when we have seen that it has not proven to be successful against the Houthis uh, when Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates uh, try to do that. I know that the Emirates have uh, uh, supported a back, back, backing a, a, a government in the south of Yemen, Yemen. I expect them to do more because they are allies both of Israel and the U.S., and I have not seen them get into action. I see that uh, America is trying to do quite the opposite than um, targeting the Houthis by uh, sending direct or indirect messages to Iran and asking them to um, tell the, the Houthis to back down. And I wonder if the idea of um, continuing the situation in U Yemen as a civil war where Yemen is facing really, truly the biggest humanitarian crisis the world now needs to address, which nobody talks about. It's the forgotten war, as many say. And I don't see that continuing um, a military operation inside Yemen will make the Houthis stop. On the contrary, I see them reacting to it by uh, increasing their attacks on allies and even going back to t attacking Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. So it, it needs to be calculated whether uh, threats of assassinations would be useful at this point uh, further. Right. Uh, General Kimmet, a few minutes ago, uh, I tried to cast uh, Michal in a primitive uh, role-playing uh, game um, as a U.S. Uh, senior U.S. Uh, policymaker, for the sake of symmetry, um, had you been uh, a senior Israeli official now, um, would you let uh, only others, um, mostly the U.S. and the coalition, act directly against the Houthis? Or is it time for the Israeli Air Force, Navy, and special forces to show the Houthis that they are very vulnerable and that um, Israel can no longer keep quiet? Well, I, I think uh, we've got enough here in Israel uh, to keep um, ourselves busy. Uh, if we want to subcontract uh, the war against the Houthis, if there are subcontractors such as the United States and others that are willing to take this on, uh, let's keep our powder dry. Uh, in many ways, <clears throat> this is not an Israeli problem. This is a worldwide problem. And the world is the one that's suffering, as you noted, that uh, international commerce can't get through the Suez Canal. The insurance companies won't let the ships uh, uh, go through into the Red Sea and, and into the canal. Uh, there are 
prices being imposed on the world because of the long routes that the ships now have to take instead of through the canal. Uh, but look, we've got enough on our hands right now, and it sounds like the rest of the world is more than happy to uh, use their aircraft, use their missiles, use their ships. So let's save a little money here and not try to be strong everywhere, and let's focus our efforts on the near and the immediate and the lethal and let our friends and our allies take care of this problem with the Houthis. But truly you remember that in 1967, uh, substantially, and even earlier in 1956, perhaps as a pretext, the Straits of Iran uh, were a casus belli uh, for Israel. But in 1973, Egypt managed to bypass this um, choke point, which is closer to the ports of Elat in Israel and Aqaba in Jordan, by uh, putting a blockade on Bab el Mandeb. Um, and now we see that uh, 50 years later, again, uh, Israel uh, is being blockaded from the south. Of course, uh, had the Israeli Navy uh, wanted to break through the blockade, it could have. But merchant marine uh, or commercial shipping um, behave uh, in a different fashion. And much like the oil embargo of 1973, which of course also had political implications, but most mostly about money. Uh, quadrupling the price, uh, goods were more expensive. The market uh, eventually uh, corrected itself. So people will pay more. What's the big deal? This is how it is uh, being perceived. No, that, that, that's exactly right. And, uh, and the insurance companies themselves are not going to le allow the ships to go through this area for fear of losing a ship or two. So uh, this is one of those, the, the issue with the Houthis right now in the grand scheme of things within Central Command area of operations and candidly for our worldwide operations is more of a, uh, an annoyance than it is a strategic challenge. Uh, there is a little bit of money that will increase. Hopefully if we continue to put pressure on the Iranian supply routes, both on the water and on the land, that these guys will run out of missiles uh, soon enough. Uh, you talk about high costs, the missiles that we are using to knock down those drones and, and those uh, rockets that are being fired by the Houthis is enormous, uh, about 100 to 1 in terms of the cost to shoot one down. But look, as the old saying goes, you can't be strong everywhere so there have to be main efforts, there have to be supporting efforts, and candidly right now, the issue with the Houthis has now become a supporting effort. That will change, of course, if the Houthis get lucky and they hit an American ship or a coalition ship with a significant amount of casualties. But for now, I think that the combatant commanders are willing to take that risk. Michal, what can Israel do uh, through the uh, various uh, neighboring countries, uh, especially Saudi Arabia and Oman? Now, uh, with Oman, of course, Israel um, has had um, a long-standing relationship going back uh, at least to the 1970s, perhaps uh, um, outside of Iran, under the Shah, perhaps uh, the first Gulf state uh, to have such a relationship with, with Israel. And Saudi Arabia, we hear um, that um, they want to normalize their relations with Israel. Can't Israel do something either uh, through their governments or at least through their borders? Well, of course, that I always believe that we can do more with uh, allies, but we first have to understand are their allies and do our interests match. So regarding Oman, just uh, I think the other day, the uh, Iranian foreign minister met with the Houthi spokesperson to show unification of the cause and, and further discussions about the situation in, in uh, the region. So that shows you that Oman is also facilitating such talks, uh, which kind of makes me wonder as an Israeli, are they on our side or no side or what side are they on? Um, I, I believe that they're on the side of protecting their nation as well, uh, because there are of course, in the midst of all this, and they do not want to be hurt by the Houthis. And uh, regarding Saudi Arabia, again, this is a long history. They are 
uh, trying to get out of the Yemen war unsuccessfully because there is some kind of an unspoken truth that continues for over a year now. Uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to cut a deal uh, with the Houthis and they now have uh, better relations with Iran. Uh, because they have uh, reestablished their uh, relations with Iran, not because they're friends again, uh, mainly to try and uh, hold back any attacks that could happen again, such as the attack on Aramco that caused uh, multiple damage, not only to Saudi Arabia, but to the, uh, the oil markets worldwide. I think um, normalization with Saudi Arabia is complicated for Israel. I think the Houthis uh, uh, are more close to making a deal with Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't call it normalization, but a truce agreement uh, than Israel is with Saudi Arabia, which is why it's understandably uh, not trying to get into the, co the different coalitions that are now operating in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of uh, Aden and, and um, uh, furthermore into the Indo-Pacific. I, I think that we are facing a unique situation, and I want to say that I do think that Israel has a place to be part or an uh, official part of the different coalitions because it does have a lot of intelligence on the region. It is a threat to us. It will always be a threat to us. And if the Houthis don't like something that happens, such as a normalization deal with Israel, we, we will be a target again. I also believe that the Houthis are arming um, and we have a problem because Iran is being smart and strategizing furthermore, now uh, reestablishing ties with Somalia and reestablishing ties with Sudan. And these are routes for weapon transfer, which further uh, can uh, be a problem for us because the Houthis don't stop. Uh, they might use different uh, missiles or, or drones or different kinds of uh, combinations of attacks, but they will not stop arming. We see that any enemy, any terror group does not stop just because uh, a war stops or a truce has, has, achieved, has been achieved. So this is something for the Israeli uh, government to consider. They have to pay better attention to all aspects of the Houthis' actions and um, and different relations that they have with the countries that we want to be uh, friendly with regarding Oman and Saudi Arabia and even Egypt, which has stayed very, very far from the conflict. Uh, General, a couple of years ago, uh, after the um, Houthis launched missiles into Saudi Arabia and the Saudis uh, responded in kind, so to speak, by airstrikes, which were not very precise, there were many civilian casualties. It seems, uh, in hindsight, like a precursor of the Biden administration's view of the Gaza war from the Israeli perspective. If you kill too many non-combatants, uh, we are going to order you to stop or to condition our aid. Was that a mistake? Should the U.S. have allowed the Saudis to go on with their air offensive? Or was it so um, uh, ineffective that it was better to call it off? I, I don't think they actually called it off, but I think we restricted uh, sufficient capabilities to the Saudis that they really couldn't do it. When we cut off the intelligence, that was uh, probably uh, what really slowed that and completely stopped that. I was actually running yesterday with one of the U.S. advisors that was inside the uh, Saudi Operations Center for that very purpose in terms of sharing intelligence. And uh, it was very clear that without the intelligence that they couldn't, that the situation would be even far worse than it was uh, already. Uh, but I think that that's a bad comparison to what's happening right now uh, in Gaza. Uh, it, what, what I continue to laugh at is just the poor thinking that is being done by our legislators that are calling for cutting off precision capabilities to uh, the Israeli Air Force in particular, uh, because all that will do will cause the uh, Israelis either to not continue the war or to use non-precision capabilities that may in fact create even further casualties than we would have seen if they had been given precision weapons. So. 
there are also a political dimension uh, back here in the United States that was certainly not part of the Houthi situation or the Houthi Saudi situation. So um, I, I'm not really comfortable trying to compare the two because they are so vastly different. The most disturbing part of your answer was the relation that uh, you are chatting while running. Um, this um, may not help your physical training too much. So now that you are sitting down, can you um, give us some words of wisdom regarding what should be done next? Well, first of all, I would hardly call what I do running. I do put <laughs> one foot in front of the other, and I, I convince myself that's running. But at my age, uh, just getting out there is enough. No, listen, I, I think, again, this is more of a political decision than a military decision. Prime Minister Netanyahu, to me, seems to be thinking about his long-term le legacy. He does not want to be another prime minister that that does not finish the job and sees a new Yasser Arafat driving down the, the streets of Beirut, waving his flags and declaring victory. Uh, I think that the United States... Uh, would be better served by just simply having quiet diplomacy with the government rather than trying to um, have this entire discussion with the, with the state of Israel uh, on national television. Uh, it's clear that, candidly, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is listening politely to what President Biden has to say and then just going ahead and doing what he wants to do. So uh, if I had any advice to give, it wouldn't be anything more than get it over, get it over quick, be as violent as you can, because in the long term, uh, doing it quick and doing it violently uh, saves lives rather than if you try to do it slow uh, and do it somewhat passively. Thank you, both of you. Uh, General Mark Kimmett, Assistant Secretary, Brigadier General U.S. Army, and geopolitical expert Michal Beitalachmi. This has been Jerusalem Studio from TV7 Israel News, and we will be back with another edition of Jerusalem Studio very soon. For the time being, Shalom from Jerusalem. Jerusalem.